the idea, the inspiration for the film itself really came from a shot that was um, kind of the brainchild of uh, Blake Thompson, the co-writer. We were on our way home from the cinemas and he brought up this shot that he had in mind and essentially it revolved around a couple of Vikings emerging from a lake. And from there really we kind of brainstormed the idea a little bit further and as it developed we ended up ditching that shot entirely but this new story emerged and it was really a fast process of finding the story and finding our characters and the world just evolved from there. Firstly the way in which me and Stephen um, wrote The Raven was that it was meant essentially one giant conversation that like escalates into like a disastrous mess. Our actual script writing process is very unconventional so what most people would do is they would go away, write their separate sections of the script that they're planning to do. Whereas uh, Stephen and I, we quite literally write word for word, sentence for sentence, like in real time. By the time we finish the first draft, it's essentially the second draft because two eyes have been over it already. It's pretty unconventional, but like it works for, for us. Really, if you talk about inspirations, we were obviously inspired by the Vikings television show, but it just seemed to be an era that was sort of ambitious and different for things being made in Perth. So it excited us in that way. As a producer on a short film, you kind of wear many hats. You're thinking of unit, you're thinking as a location manager. The things that I look at in a location is how far out of the city is it? Is it accessible? Are people going to be able to bring equipment down here, cars? But also, does it actually go with the films that suit? Does Stephen and Blake like it? The script is set in Scandinavia and um Basically, it's one location, it's a pine forest. There's no native pine forest in, in Australia, so that was like a challenge on its own. We couldn't pick something that looked Australian, which is very hard when you live in Australia. <laughs> so we firstly had to find a location that, you know, was either a man-made pine forest that looked authentic or we simulated it. And we ended up finding a place in Mundaring, which actually had a really nice uh, pine forest and like with trees, but it unfortunately it was surrounded by um, Australian bush, which was too hard to hide and masquerade from the camera. So we eventually settled with another place um, in Jaredale which um, had an entire pine, man-made pine forest, um, which was beautiful, these tall pine trees. There was um, these beautiful green clovers on the ground. It looked visually aesthetic, exactly the same look that Steve and I were wanting to get. Unfortunately, there was these uh, big four-wheel drive tracks that went through the entire forest. We were able to you know, storyboard and shot list around that and use clever angles in order to, to hide the tracks that went through. Built a shrine to hide this wooden stake that wasn't here all the other times we've been here. Was and it? now it's here. Great stuff. But um, in the end, like we were very, very happy with the location. It was exactly what we were wanting, and um, yeah, couldn't be in, couldn't be more happy with it. Myself and Blake love to tell stories about the underdog. We saw that Astrid's character was definitely the underdog in this situation. You know, she was the youngest member of the group. She was coming up. She has Arn by her side as her king, but she's yet to prove herself to the rest of the clan. What we wanted to do is kind of have this representation of the kind of elder statesman of the group, reluctant to kind of let her have a shot. And from there, really, the story built and built and built, and we felt like we were creating a really compelling character and that the narrative was naturally centered around her. Astrid is the king's wife and she kind of has the responsibility of like the mother of everyone in a way so she still needs to show that she's strong and confident and powerful because she's supposed to be the second leader so she's very adamant about proving herself to everyone. Well I've always been typecast as the girl next door so kind of a nervous shy girl so when I saw this audition I was like I've got to give it a go this is something completely different something new. <laughs> Arn is the king of the Vikings um, he's just recently come into the position of power so he's still new trying to prove himself in everything that he's doing. A strong man um, strong in his belief in himself but still trying to prove that he's the right man for the job. The name Magnus actually means powerhouse in Old Norse. So I think that gives a good indication as to what he stands for. He's very strength oriented and he ultimately believes strength will ensure the clan's survival. I always like imagining the characters I'm playing as uh, an animal because I think it gives a good basis for characteristics of movement. So I always had this sense that Magnus was a caged animal because he felt, felt like he had all this pent up rage. I asked our director Stephen at the beginning of the process what animal he thought Magnus might be and he told me to look at jackals. So I watched a few videos online about how jackals would hunt. Uh, Horgan's role is essentially 
the King's right hand muscle. He's a, um, a part of a small Viking group that goes off into um, the new world. Things happen. I don't know if I'm allowed to give away any more than that. I'm feeling hungry. You know, yesterday we let a ball go. Um, Astrid missed the shot. Didn't get deep ball. Yeah. 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 Good. My process usually with production design is I try and extract as much as possible out of the people that I'm working for. It was fun to work with Stephen Blake in the sense that the more I asked them to give me more details, more information about the characters, more about their background, who they were, what they were wearing, what they had for lunch last week, the more they could give me. They were just very happy to do that. So um, yeah, so we had like big uh, write-outs of all the characters. When you're working on uh, costume dramas or anything like that, it's really complicated. A, a thing that I always try and get across is a, an audience member is not going to remember a lot of big sort of blanks of, of information. They're going to remember like a key detail about someone, whether it's braiding in hair or you know a brooch or something like that. It's always going to be some sort of like key detail, and that's going to be the memory. Each of those characters has has those sort of like differences in texture and differences in sort of um, uh, in those key details that makes them sort of important. I, I really enjoyed the fur on the shoulders. I think there's something quite inherently violent about displaying a kill in the way of fur, but yeah, it would have to be the, the weapons and also the, the extensions in the hair. And, um, I, I thought that was really cool. The physical change for the character came about with in, in uh, the script reads and the practices, you know, you're, you're in casual clothes and everything and although you're starting to get a sense for the character and, and you're building it in your mind, truly when you get on set and you finally put on that costume and look at yourself through your camera phone because there's no mirrors on, on set, you really do feel like you're that character. You're wearing the weight of the armour, you're, you're carrying the weapons, you know, you feel that physical transformation. Definitely the hair and makeup, just because it was so like dirty and kind of so different to what I'm like. So it was it was slightly challenging for me to be like, oh, there's dirt on my face, I need to wipe it off. But it was also something really fun because I'd never done that before, so it was a really great change. The axe was amazing, like just holding that thing it made me get into character um, because it was such a, it's, a, it's such a violent weapon coolest weapon on set and I'm not biased at all. <laughs> Holly was great, she was definitely the boss of everyone. You can see that everyone kind of looked up to her in a way because they're like oh my god Holly's coming ever and be nice. It was awesome. I've never actually, I don't think I've ever worked with a child actor before but she was incredible. She was like this ball of energy and she was just so funny, always cracking jokes and being really adorable and yeah, she was amazing. It was different for me because I'd always been the youngest person on set, so when I saw her I was like, oh, this is new, I'm like the older person now. I've always wanted her to pursue something within the arts um, and with, with the theatre, she's been there. She's been in the green room, she's been behind the scenes, she's almost been like a mascot for a lot of productions. She was brought into the Raven because I was in the Raven and we needed a kid that we could manhandle um, <laughs> comfortably. And you know, being her dad, who better to, to you know, uh, to throw a kid around than their own father. What's up? What's up? I think, from what I saw, fit in from day one. She came in and owned the place. Everyone seemed to get along well with her and she loved everyone back, yeah. I think it's, Fantastic that productions like this are being made by forward-thinking and passionate filmmakers, crew and, and cast alike. And I'm hoping that this uh, sort of serves as a, a benchmark that people can achieve for small budgets but, but high passion in this kind of thing. You know, that people just, if they want to put something together, that they'll put it together. And I think this is an absolute testament as to what people can achieve.